So let's look at our passage. For I would have you know, brothers, what does Paul want us to know? That the gospel was preached by me, the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. It's God's gospel. So what does God's gospel, not from man, look like? God's gospel comes with authority, and that's on your sheet. You can start if you like, if you like to do that kind of thing. (laughs) Um, God's gospel comes with authority. So the eternal God with no end and no beginning, the sovereign God who governs all things, the omniscient God who knows all things, the creator and sustainer of all things. Hebrews says he upholds the universe by his word. That's authority like no other. Romans 11, for from him and through him and to him are all things. Job 23, but he stands alone. Who can oppose him? God's gospel comes with God's authority. God's gospel also comes in power. Romans 1, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. 1 Thessalonians 1, our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. And we're going to clearly see this in our passage. God's gospel comes in power. God's gospel is also complete. And we're going to sit here a little bit longer. Acts 17, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. God is self-sufficient, needful of nothing, yet needed by all. Contrast man. Isaiah 40, all flesh is grass and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. Surely people are grass. Us, mere humans, fallible, finite beings, think we can add something that God missed? No, God's gospel is complete. Colossians 2, and in Christ you've been brought to fullness. 2 Corinthians 12, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient. Hebrews 10 talks about priests who repeatedly had to offer the same sacrifices, which it says, which could never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, and by that single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Hebrews 7, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. God's gospel is sufficient, complete, to the uttermost. God's gospel is all grace. 1 Corinthians 4, what do you have that you did not receive? And if then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Ephesians 2, for by grace you've been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. And we're going to see this in, in the passage, right? God's gospel is all grace. God's gospel is also a relationship. Jesus reconciles us to God. 2 Corinthians 5, now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And when Paul says, you're turning to a different gospel, he says in Galatians 1, he says, I'm astonished you're so quickly deserting him. You're deserting a relationship. And this is why it matters so much to Paul. In our passage, Paul shows over and over that this gospel is from God, which comes with authority, comes in power, is complete, is all grace, and is a relationship. So Paul starts off, for I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that, and sisters, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For I did not receive it from any man because it doesn't come from man, nor was I taught it, I didn't even learn it from people. I wasn't trained in it. See, Paul had trained for years in Judaism under rabbis. And we know he was taught by Gamaliel, one of the experts of the law. His training in the law was extensive and by the best of the day. And that would have been something to be proud of, to boast about. And it would have given credence to his words when he would speak in the synagogue. He would have been listened to because of how he had trained and who he was trained under. That's his training under the law. But here he says about the gospel, he says no one taught him. He didn't sit under any sort of teaching. And so he wasn't trained in the gospel. Paul's not boasting in his intellect or his great training or him having worked so hard. He's not boasting in who he was connected to, those great or popular or highly esteemed teachers that would have made him look good. 
No, he's saying, I wasn't taught the gospel because this gospel doesn't come from man. His boast is in the gospel and not in his training in it. But I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. The gospel is accessible to all. You don't have to be educated to receive it. You don't have to work hard or strive for a long time. Now, we know Paul received this revelation, blinded and a voice from heaven. I am Jesus. I'm guessing that's not how you came to faith. (laughs) It's not how I came to faith. Paul hadn't walked with Jesus like the other disciples had, and he, but he had Jesus come directly to him. And it, he, this is why he can be an apostle, because Jesus came directly to him. But I think we can think of Paul's apostleship and his radical conversion, and we can kind of distance ourselves. We can think that what he's saying here is not the same thing, that it didn't, the same thing didn't happen to us. But listen, the wording received is the same. Galatians 1.9 from our passage last week. So now I say again, if anyone's preaching to a gospel contrary to the one you received. 1 Corinthians 15. Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received. Colossians 2. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And we're told repeatedly in scripture that the gospel is something we receive. That's why our boast is not in us obtaining our salvation, but in the cross of Christ. Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ, Paul says. And commentators tell us the word for revelation literally means unveiling, a laying bare, the removal of that which conceals or obscures. Is that not what happens when we receive Christ? Our spiritual eyes are open. So though Paul received this revelation directly from Jesus, who appeared to him, and his was to be an apostle to the Gentiles, we also receive the gospel, and receive a revelation of Jesus. We're not apostles, but we still receive the gospel, right? And then Paul gives his testimony. And oh, the testimony of one who is now a new creation is powerful. And we know there was a huge change in Paul from persecutor of the church to preacher and missionary. But again, we can distance ourselves thinking that it was so radical, right? We're not like that. But let's look deeper than Paul's outward behavior and personality and notice his words and the change of affections in his heart. And we're going to see, like, he's not boasting himself. He's not boasting his training, his intelligence, or the circle of people around him. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. He was a persecutor, he was violent, he was destructive, and he said it was his life, my former life in Judaism. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Advancing, seeking success. Why would Paul say, beyond many of my own age? Why would somebody mention that? Because that's what had mattered to him, right? There was a comparing before, a self-righteousness, a a man-pleasing, and a pride. He had been better than others, on top and proud of it, zealous for traditions and self-serving success. And he's telling the Galatians, this is what I was. This is what mattered to me before I met Jesus. And then the change. And notice Paul doesn't focus here on Paul. Have we got it up there? Yes. So he doesn't, Paul doesn't say, these are the bad things I was doing, and now look at all the good things. Notice the central character is God, and Paul is secondary. But when he, who had set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, when he was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. In Paul's testimony, the central character is God. I grew up in a pretty messed up home. I raised my younger sister because my mom was checked out, um, herself a broken person in need. My dad was charged for things that he did to us. My eldest brother threatened to kill me. Um, I was a foster child in my teen years. By God's kindness and grace, he saved me, both from my sin and from that life. I remember sharing my testimony in front of a church years ago. And afterwards, several people came up to me and they said, I don't remember the exact wording, but they came up and they said things like, wow, you've been through so much and look at you, you're so strong in the Lord. This was many years ago, and I don't remember what I said in my testimony. I remember it felt good at the time, but looking back, I'm guessing by the responses I remember, wow, look at you. You're so strong in the Lord. 
I, remember, I think that the central character of my testimony that day was Melinda, and God was secondary. And I robbed God of glory that day because I didn't truly understand the gospel. The verse right before our passage says, in Galatians 1.10, it says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. We cannot be people-pleasing and serving Christ at the same time. It's actually impossible. It's one or the other. Pastor John Piper says, Be done with man-pleasing, or you will not be a reliable witness to the truth. That was me. My testimony that day, I was not a reliable witness to the truth. But we can see the difference in Paul. He's no longer a man pleaser. And I think the radical change in Paul was because he understood his sin. He knew what he was saved from better than I did. He understood the grace given him better than I did. Knowing the gospel will grow our speech and our testimony to more and more reflect the truth that our salvation is of God alone and Christ alone is our boast. Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Paul doesn't just say it once. He hammers it home, really. He's saying it in different ways, the same thing. It is God who changed him. But when he. Paul sees he's an object of action from I, Paul, to but when he. But when God, Paul's going one way, he's set, he's determined, he looked the hardest to save, the most unlikely. And if you have loved ones who look hard to save, take heart. Looking at Paul as he was before, he looked like there was no hope for him, right? So intensely zealous against Christians, against the gospel message of the cross. But look at these verses and the opposite is true. There was no hope he wouldn't be saved. But when he, listen to the authority of God, but when he, who had set me apart before I was born. Paul takes no credit. A baby can do nothing but even before he's born. Paul's showing he had absolutely nothing to do with this. This is God's doing. And the wording of this is actually before he's conceived, before he exists, God sets him apart. It's all God's doing. And who called me by his grace. Listen to Paul's words. Who called me. Paul's the receiver here, not the initiator. He gives God the credit. Sometimes in the Christian world, we'll hear someone say, when I found God. But that's not really an accurate way to say it, though, is it? In John 15, Jesus told his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Unless you or I think that the wording called only applies to Paul the Apostle, listen back to Galatians 1, 6 again. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. I heard Tim Keller talk about this once. He, he said, the call of God is different than a call from us. Our words are actually powerless. Think of a parent calling their child. Or if you've ever babysat. You call a child. Do they come instantly? Every time you call them. Our call is actually expressing a desire, right? Even if we mean it as a command. If the child doesn't want to respond, the child doesn't come. You have to go get that child. Contrast that with God's call. God's call is action. It's a deed. God's word is reality. Let there be light. And there was light. Jesus said to the storm, peace, be still. He doesn't have to go make it happen like a parent has to go get the child they called. The word of God is a word of power. When God calls, it's action. God's gospel comes in power. And that's why the gospel is news and not advice. News is something that has happened Advice is something I have to do to make happen. And if you've sensed a power dealing with you, Tim Keller describes it as a, a disruption, a disturbance, right? You're not the same after you've met God. And if you haven't received Christ, but you sense a power dealing with you, it's likely God, and you'll see he was always guiding. Called us into a relationship with God before we're even aware of God. And how did God call Paul? How does he call us? And who called me by his grace. Grace, unmerited favor, undeserved. There's tons of theology here. Why would God call us? Why would a holy, holy, holy God call sinners into relationship with him? Us sinners who in everything we do and say and think is tainted with sin. 
Even our most righteous, well-meaning, self-serving, self-sacrificing acts are filthy rags next to a perfect, sinless, spotless, holy God. See, sin is in the fabric of who we are. And I remember Paul David Tripp telling a simple story from his life to illustrate this. It's funny, it stuck with me. His wife really likes ice cream, and so he wanted to give her a little surprise one evening. And so he scoops out two bowls of ice cream, and he's just thinking, you know, she really likes ice cream. I'm going to go, and we're going to spend a little time together with a treat that she enjoys. And so he scoops them out, and as he's walking up the stairs, he finds himself looking at these two bowls of ice cream. Starts thinking, this one might have a little bit more in it. How can I make sure I get that one? Oh, it's a funny story, and we laugh, but, you know, it's because we know it's in all of us, right? Sin is in the fabric of who we are. But holiness is who God is. And God is so much more than that, even, who called me by his grace. Notice it's his grace. Grace is from God alone. He's the author of grace. Grace is in the fabric of who God is, evidenced in the cross for us. Grace doesn't exist apart from God. And Paul salutes God alone here. He says it's by his grace he calls Paul. And Paul wants the Galatians and us to understand it's all God, nothing earned, only grace. God's gospel is all grace. And he was pleased to reveal his son to me. It is God who does the revealing. If you've been saved, you can take absolutely no credit for it. Zero. None. Nothing. It's not because you're smarter. It's not because you're more in tune with God or because you're a better person. You did not turn to him apart from him calling you, apart from him revealing himself to you. And get this. Listen to what scripture says here. He, the God of the universe, the Holy One, was pleased to reveal his son to Paul. It pleased him. Pleased to reveal his son to Paul. Paul the persecutor. Paul the self-righteous man pleaser. Paul, Paul the proud. And if Christ has been revealed to you, you can know it's God's great pleasure to do so. You the liar. You the gossiper. You the people pleaser. Melinda the proud. Melinda the selfish one. God is pleased to save us. Pleased to save us. Us who have sin in the very fabric of who we are. Because it's not on our merit that he saves, but because of who he is and his grace. And it pleases him to extend grace while we're still sinners. Remember Paul saying, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? The difference of seeking the approval of man or of God is that with man it's never enough. You're never good enough, smart enough, pretty enough. There'll always be someone where you measure yourself, you come up on top sometimes, and there'll be other times you don't, right? It's slavery, But seeking the approval of God is totally different because he was pleased to reveal his son to you when you were not enough. It's not slavery with God. You don't have to seek his approval constantly. He's already pleased. His banner over you is love. That is freedom. And Paul says, why would you leave that freedom for slavery again? One of our memory verses in a few weeks is Galatians 5.1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to yoke of slavery. And we're going to talk more about that in our future lessons and the foolishness of trying to add the law to the gospel. But another aspect of that slavery we're freed from is fear of man and people-pleasing. And it frees us to a greater love. That's for another week. Paul continues in the passage giving evidence that the gospel came from God. And I wish we had time to go through it all, but we're just going to go really quickly. So, God's gospel has authority and power. God is, Paul is given the gospel by revelation of Jesus. And he goes off preaching and, they, and he doesn't immediately consult anyone for years. Remember, they didn't have internet. So if Paul says he didn't consult anything, it means Google included, right? He's saying this gospel didn't come from the other, other apostles to him. And yet the gospel is identical to theirs. It's the same gospel as the other apostles are preaching, even though Paul wasn't with them. Learning from it, it's the same gospel because it's from God. And Paul's authority as an apostle, is confirmed by the others. When they saw that I'd been trusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. But you know, the apostles weren't making a decision on Paul based on a majority vote, right? It wasn't, should we choose Paul to be an apostle? What do you think? It wasn't like that. When they saw that he was entrusted with the gospel to the Gentiles, they saw evidence of the authority and power of God. For he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles, and they perceived the grace that was given to me. 
Paul's, uh, God's gospel comes with authority and power. God's gospel is complete. Titus doesn't need to get circumcised because the gospel is complete on its own. It's adequate. It's sufficient. Nothing else needed. Saved to the uttermost. Remember, they added nothing to Paul's message. And even though there was a different commission, Peter to the Jews and Paul to the Gentiles, there was a unity of message because it's a complete gospel whether you're a Jew or Gentile or you or me. The same gospel for all. Back then as it is now, God's gospel is complete. And Paul is changed by this gospel because it's all grace and it's a relationship. He goes from having this proud heart to a humble heart. And you can hear it. If you listen really close and you get, dig down, you can see it all over the place, how he just continually points, his speech constantly points to Christ and away from himself. It's who he glorifies. But even how he went from hunting down Christians, forcing his views, to now he doesn't have to force anything because God's gospel stands on its own. He comes to the apostles and you hear the wording, he set before them the gospel he's preaching. See the different posture from hunting down to set before? It's humble but secure. He's not seeking approval of man anymore because he has approval of God. Remember my former life, I was advancing beyond many of my own age, so extremely zealous. He was training under the best, puffed up, and now taking words directly from the text. He didn't consult anyone. So it's not about advancing anymore or who he knows. Paul was still unknown in person. His position with others don't ma doesn't matter anymore. He doesn't have to prove himself. Those who seemed influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Paul's not using other people for his own advancement. He's showing no partiality like God. He's a changed man. So that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. This is so important to Paul. He's bold and unyielding but it's others focused rather than advancing himself. To make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. How Paul runs, and what he runs for, it's so different now, right? The gospel for the sake of others. And others see evidence in his life when they saw. And he considered himself as entrusted with the gospel. Rather than something he's using to advance himself, he's not boasting in his apostleship, having seen Jesus speak to him. <laughs> He doesn't boast about it at all, but instead he's acknowledging it's from God and he's entrusted with this. And he's given the right hand of fellowship. Again, that unity, even though there's diversity. And he's eager to remember the poor. We show no partiality because God has done that for us. And Paul writes about this in another letter. He says in 2 Corinthians, he says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. So not only do we, not, do we need, not need to be people pleasers so we can feel better about ourselves because that's really what fear of man is meant, right? But now, those that I might have thought better than me or those that I might have thought under me, we're one with now. We show no partiality because before God, we were all poor and now made rich. Everything is level at the cross. What freedom. So what do we do with all this? We see what Paul wants us to know, that it's God's gospel. Now, what do we do with it? And I often get caught up in application. Tell me what I'm supposed to do. But the message of the gospel is that it's been done for you. Jesus lived the perfect life for you, and he died in your place for your sins to reconcile you to God. We know the story, right? But it's all God. It's something you've received, unmerited, by grace. And what does Paul say he wants to do? There's plenty of times in Scripture where we're told to do something. But here, tell, Paul tells us to know, because the doing has to flow out of the knowing. For I would have you know, brothers. So the application is to know. Know that the gospel you've received is from God alone, and knowing will change us as it changed Paul. The more we know it, the more it will change us.